Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. <laughs> Dr. Alan Proctor, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today on the Conversation Podcast with me, your host, Luis Ramirez. So Dr. Alan Proctor, you're the president and CEO of Social Ventures located over here in Columbus, Ohio. You have a PhD in economics and forecasting from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And you also wrote two books on money, which it seems is called Mission to Money, Finance for Nonprofit Leaders and More Than Just Money. Uh, those are the two books that you wrote. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. And I know that uh, I said that those two books are about money, but I'm sure there's definitely more to those two books. Is that, is that correct? Um, yes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be with you today. Um, there are books about how oftentimes uh, money becomes the, uh, the sole end focus in a, in a company, a business, or a nonprofit, and that we really have to really refocus on the role of of money in that so that the finance people are really a um, a way f to help a company think not the group of people that make the decisions that's a lot to chew in there huh <laughs> well it's it's the result of kind of watching uh, several decades of what works in organizations and what doesn't work all right, so you were basically behind the scenes in those organizations of what worked and what didn't work, and that, that was a product of these two books. Is that correct? Um, that's right. Um, it's a combination of the reason I actually wrote the books when I did was um, it was becoming very clear that um, the uh, hostility towards uh, the public sector and, frankly, a growing hostility towards the nonprofit sector um, was uh, needed to be uh, addressed and that um, those organizations really needed to um, uh, revisit their basics. Um, and uh, so, I, so I wrote those books. It, it also was an outgrowth of my work in, in um, government and in the um, Government Financial Office Association where in the 1990s, we uh, had a national uh, working group that put together best practices in public budgeting uh, because we were seeing that the federal government was a terrible example of uh, responsible uh, budget practice. Hmm. So you said the hostility, a couple of things that you said there, what kind of hostility that were you talking about? What did you see? Well, it started, uh, it started out in the, in the late 90s with uh, uh, an organization called um, Charity Navigator that created this notion that if a nonprofit spent anything except on program, it was irresponsible. But so what that means is you can't pay for your lights, you can't pay for your heat, you can't pay for any financial accountability, um, you can't provide health care benefits, you can't, it's, it's ridiculous. So when people were saying all our money goes to, to program, well, that's the key to inefficiency and incompetence. No business would write itself. And what was happening was uh, grantors and government contractors were starting to say they wouldn't pay any overhead. Well, if you can't, if you can't pay rent, I mean, it's what we're going through in the COVID crisis, right? If you can't pay rent, if you can't pay your utilities, you're out of business. And that was the trend that was starting um, in, our, in, our, uh, in our society. And it was terrible. And frankly, it was started here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, by the United Way of Central Ohio. Um, and the person who started it became uh, the head of the National uh, United Way, and it just spread. It was called effective philanthropy, but it, it, it sounded great. It sucked me in until I saw how it was playing itself out. It was, um, it was counterproductive. So for those that don't uh, uh, that are listening to this, Charity Navigator is a company pretty much, we could just start there. They're a company that publishes, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, they're a, public, a company that publishes the data regarding the nonprofit organizations out there, 501c3. They, and they, they, rate, they rate nonprofits. They rate nonprofits. They rate nonprofits based on a one single criteria. And um, so this started in the late 90s and it got to the point where, thank goodness, five years ago, Charity Navigator published uh, an apology letter to the nonprofit sector for, huh. for the harm that it had caused. Now, what kind of harm was the financial harm, I assume? The impact for, from a financial standpoint, right? Because yeah. nonprofits are, are a business. 
they're a business. Can you imagine running a business where you know, your customers say, well, I like your product, but your, your price is including uh, a profit. It's including overhead. Uh, I'm only going to pay your cost of goods sold. Listen, well, I, uh, yeah, I started a nonprofit organization in 2008, and that lasted for like three or four years. So it's definitely, it's definitely a number one. It's definitely a business, uh, and the fact that it's titled a nonprofit, you still have to make, you have to still have to balance that, right? You still have to make some profits to be able to give those services to the community, like you said. So it is, it is a very unfortunate term. Um, outside the United States, they call them uh, non-governmental organizations (NGOs). Yes, um, they're technically um, 501c3 charitable organizations, but after that mouthful, you know, you, you need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the organization that you started is called Central Venture, Social Ventures. That's right. We started that in 2014. Yep. Um, it was really the, the result of, I had been uh, working as a consultant for uh, nonprofits since 2001. And uh, so I'd seen uh, two uh, recessions and what they did to the nonprofit sector. And what, what, what I observed was that nonprofits were, um, many nonprofits, I should say, were actually cutting back their services in a recession. Uh, and uh, which is actually the worst time for a nonprofit to cut back because that's when they're most needed. And um, from my years in um, government and the nonprofit sector, I'd come to the conclusion that uh, the most important thing for a provider of services is to be reliable because people are building their lives around your being there. And um, exactly when the recession happened and people needed it, they disappeared. And uh, the nonprofits that were able to sustain themselves were ones that had been able to build uh, a solid base earned revenues. Uh, for example, uh, one of my clients was COSI. And COSI was basically in financial difficulty. It's a local science museum. Uh, it was in financial difficulty because it moved to a very, very large facility and um, that it, it really couldn't support. And uh, I worked with them on uh, building uh, their earned revenues. And in the 10 years since then, they were able to double their size without increasing their fundraising at all and become a fairly strong organization, um, at least until COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided that what we needed was not a consultant working with three or four nonprofits to help make them reliable. What we needed to do is to build an ecosystem that could sustain a substantial growth in uh, social enterprises. Uh, initially, uh, social enterprises run by nonprofits, but ultimately what's played out in Columbus is it's now almost evenly split between for-profit and nonprofit social enterprises. And uh, they are now, I'm thrilled to say, uh, the largest job creator for ex-offenders, recovering addicts, survivors of human trafficking, people on the autism spectrum, and the chronically homeless. They, without any government money or philanthropic money, they're doing more than all the government put together. It's amazing. You know, uh, Nancy, there's a story uh, that you have on your, on your report, 2019 report. And when I opened the report, I realized that there's 98 different companies or partners that you have. Uh, part of this ecosystem. But in this report, you highlight 11 different companies uh, within the state of Ohio, I believe, that, that pretty much make an impact. And the secret sauce that you speak about is people. And yes. on, the, on the second page, I see Nancy, the story of Nancy with human trafficking, I believe it was, and how she, yep. she, he, she converted herself into a confident team leader. And I was sucked in immediately. But then as I turned the pages, there was stories upon stories of, of, and stories of more people looking at that right yes sir yes sir exactly so when i looked at her at that picture and her and then i continued looking on and on and on by the time i got to the end of the page that it, that is the nucleus how you know the people that you're helping with the challenges that they had in the past and now they're basically changing so kudos to to you and social ventures for doing that so maybe you could elaborate on 
you know, how the, how the process of all that, how, how does that really happen? The magic? Well, well, let, let me, let me first answer uh, your question at the micro level. Yep. Um, Nancy works for uh, an organization called Clean Turn. Clean Turn is a social enterprise, for-profit social enterprise, that uh, focuses primarily on uh, providing employment to people who are um, have been caught up in the justice system. Um, that usually, that sometimes includes all the complications where uh, being incarcerated is the result. It could be um, people who have uh, tremendous challenges with uh, freeing themselves from drugs. It could be people who have been in such broken homes that they've been homeless and such. The, the concept of those social enterprises, which makes them so different than another business, is they call them it supportive employment. So in a, in a typical business, if a person comes in late chronically, you fire them. In a typical business, if someone starts lipping off at their boss, you fire them. In a supportive employment environment, uh, you basically uh, say, okay, they're late because they're having transportation difficulties. I'll deal with the transportation issue. Um, they're very stressed and angry because they're having housing and budget problems. I'll work with them on housing. I'll help teach them about budgeting. I'll, I'll make sure that they know about how to use a bank account and how when you get the paycheck at the beginning of the month, you have to save some for the end of the month because they've never had that experience. You know, um, if someone comes in and they don't look very productive, instead of yelling at them, you basically say, well, they know enough about Joe to say, Joe, what's, what's happening today? You're not like this. Um, it's, a, it's a totally <clears throat> different approach to employment, where instead of I'm hiring this person because I need a job done, and if they don't do it, you know, I'll get somebody else. It's I'm creating this job to help their life be better. Let me do that. Now, obviously, you can't help everybody, and some people might be so challenging you can't make it work, and you can't let your company be brought down by that. But um, in, indeed, they find. Uh, there's a lot of peer enforcement on people who are having challenges and it, it works. And that's what Nancy is talking about is she has an employer that understands her challenges, is help is sympathetic with her challenges. Um, uh, tough love is probably a fair term um, and has turned her life around. Our job at Social Ventures is to create an environment where companies like Clean Turn can thrive. So our job is to make people aware of social enterprise, aware that when you buy from Clean Turn, you're actually creating an impact because what most of us are familiar with and, and, and what was certainly true in Columbus until you know just 10 years ago was if you wanted to make impact in your community, you had two choices. You volunteered or you wrote a charitable contribution. What happens with the introduction of social enterprises, yes, you can still volunteer. Yes, you can still make charitable contributions if it happens to be organized as a 501c3. But by what you buy can make a difference. You can buy a candle and pr help provide jobs for survivors of trafficking. You can buy a cup of coffee and, and provide money to the food bank. You can buy hot sauce. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a whole new concept. And of course, since they're businesses, you can invest in these businesses and create impact. You know, it's not like buying stock in IBM where you do it just to make money. You can invest in these companies and make a difference. It's it's like four legs of a stool. I, it's really exciting. I, I I so we're trying to make people more aware of that whole notion of of consumption. Obviously, what we're also doing is because there were only eighteen of these social enterprises when we started in 2014 15, and we're actually at 105 today. Ah, okay. COVID, we might be back down again. We've lost three in the last two weeks. Um, uh, we, we need to provide some kind of training, mentorship, and support because they're, they're new to business, many of them. 
Um, and the third thing is we have to connect them to capital because you can't build a business without money. And uh, starting a business on your own credit card only takes you so far. You know, uh, I was getting really excited when I uh, started getting ready, ready for this conversation because I, I, uh, I learned that, you, that you're an economist. Uh, you have a PhD in economy, in economy and also forecasting. And I wanted to hear your thoughts on, because you've mentioned a couple of things that I, uh, I wanted to circle back on, uh, where as a nonprofit, and trust me, like I said before, I was a founder of a nonprofit, so I get the importance uh, in the impact that, that any nonprofit has. Pre-COVID, your job and your social ventures program uh, was definitely important. And when people pull back, you mentioned the two recessions that you've, uh, you've experienced before, and that kind of led you to start social ventures. And now you mentioned that uh, you were at one of five, three uh, other companies pulled back. A lot, there's a lot of information there to un unpack in, that, in, in, in the context of what I'm trying to bring up. But the question is basically, what is your forecast now that the COVID is here <laughs> and the impact to, uh, to the nonprofit sector, not just in Columbus, not just in Ohio, but uh, in the, you know, we could take it in a macro level, micro level. Uh, we could take it from any type of uh, economist point of view, but from your perspective, what is, what is gonna be the impact to your program per se? Now that you know we're talking about the COVID uh, economic crisis and you know people losing their jobs and like you said right here with the story with uh, with Nancy as, as just one example we could talk we could probably spend multiple podcasts talking about other examples but people have a need right for transportation for housing budgeting banking there's going to be a huge void there what what are your thoughts for forecasting I guess for the outcome. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the only honest answer to say is I don't know. For sure, um, so for sure. But I can speculate. Um, I think the real, the, real, the real challenge in COVID is those people and those businesses that made a living through contact with other people um, have basically um, stopped for the moment. Um, the, question is how long will it last? Um, one of the realities for our social enterprises is they're small. And it's become very clear already that the um, so-called small business uh, loan program it's is gone. being hustled by, has been hustled by the large companies. Yep. Um, and uh, the large companies are getting the money. Yep. Um, the lines get twenty five billion, and who in Columbus got anything? Wait, are you talking um, about the CARES Act or the really, PPP? Um, well, the CARES Act had the PPP in it. Okay. Um, the PPP. Most of our social enterprises have fewer than ten employees. Um, I I would love to see when this is over how many of them got anything, um, as opposed to. Um, large restaurant chains that had smart lawyers who, who quickly uh, um, created subsidiaries of under 500 employees mm. and um, have gotten tens of millions of dollars. Um, how many uh, uh, social enterprises that employ 10 or fewer people or even small businesses, mom and pop businesses that employ a few family members, how many of them got anything? Um, it um, it's unfortunate. Um, the uh, I think what the real challenge is how how this will open up. Um, if it opens up by those companies that um, are highly visible, um, then I think we will lose a, a lot of our small businesses. Um, the uh, uh, restaurants um, the Many are small restaurants as opposed to the large chains. Um, will people, when will people be comfortable being in the crowd? <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's unpredictable. Uh, actually, the companies that I worry about the most are the ones that um, were prepared and had strong balance sheets because the um, all the money is going to those who were not prepared and are in crisis and and those that aren't in crisis because they they uh, saved for a rainy day um, come September they will probably be out of cash 
and will there still be enough of a focus to help them? Um, so, I, in fact, I, we've been obviously calling our social enterprises, and many of them, their biggest worries are about 2021. Um, because uh, those who, who have scaled back or have cash and maintained their employees, such as social ventures, we're maintaining all of our employees. Um, but will, will um, business be back by the fourth quarter? Uh, will it be at the level that it used to be? Um, will people have a whole different attitude about uh, public events? Um, I worry the most actually about our, our performing arts institutions. Um, there's nothing, you, you, you sit, that's as close as you can be next to a person when you're, when you're in a theater or an auditorium. Sure. And um, almost all of their, uh, almost all of their musicians or actors or dancers are uh, contract 1099 employees who can't right. even get unemployment. Um, so what's, they're, they're actually the worst in, in the worst situation of all. Um, they, uh, they, they probably can't, they probably made money by teaching students, can't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Zoom does not work <laughs> that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, they're not able to do any performances. You know, there's a lot of press on them kind of playing outdoors and that's keeping their chops going and keeping them busy, but it's not making them any money. And our, our whole system is not set up for them. What about the Uber drivers? You know, they can't get anything. That's true. Um, so are we gonna step up uh, on, a, you know, uh, are our government programs geared towards these small individuals? The answer is no. Are they going to become geared? I don't know. Um, we'll just have to see how it how it plays out. You know, but, you mentioned. Um, I don't know what it's going to be on the other side. We we have a lot of high contact programs. Our biggest our biggest program of the year is August fourth. Um, we have hundreds of people in a room to celebrate social enterprise. Are people going to be comfortable, or will be be allowed? <laughs> To have it, and that's in August. Um, uh, they've rescheduled the gay pride parade for October. Will they allow a million people to be on this? Of course, I don't know. Um, uh, it, it's, I think, the hardest thing in, in predicting the future is this is so unprecedented. You can't do, uh, you can't make it out. I've, I've seen two major collapses. One was the 1987 stock market crash. Um, things were basically, it was mostly financial. It was uh, um, a decade where there were a lot of rolling recessions in the US. And um, things didn't get back till normal until 1994. Wow. That was seven years. And what was the second one? Second one uh, was 2008. That's what I, I assume. And that, that, that was, uh, that had a lot of bankruptcies, but financially, it was a financial collapse. The government at that point was, was able to step in quickly and smartly. Um, and uh, the stock market was back within nine months. And uh, the part that went wrong was by focusing just on the financial markets. Um, we never really got um, growth well established. And in this crisis, uh, the government's in the worst possible position it could have been in. Um, fiscal policy is, we already had a tr trillion dollar deficit. We should have been running surpluses um, the last eight years. And the government has no money. So now we're going to have a $2 trillion deficit. Um, that is not, not a good formula for the young professional's future. It, it isn't. And uh, a couple of things there that you mentioned were con consumer confidence, right? The consumer confidence yes. both for the, for the business side, but also for the, uh, the consumer side. You know, if you don't have that, how, how are we, uh, it's going to be a huge uh, hurdle to, to overcome. Well, there's also a lot of momentum. I mean, a lot of, a lot of con uh, consumption practices your habits. Um, Every Friday night you went out. 
Are you gonna go out every Friday night again? <laughs> when is that habit gonna come back? Or exactly. after work, we went out for drinks. Is that habit exactly. gonna come back? Or, um, you know, you, um, you subscribed for a, a, a concert season or a theater season. Well, you don't even know if there's gonna be a season. Um, you know, or, you know, you regularly uh, uh, went out to the mall to shop. Now you're, you're doing everything online. Um, are you gonna go back? Um, you met people in coffee shops. Um, now you're doing it on Zoom. Are you gonna stay on Zoom? Um, it, 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 it's interesting. I, I think about our own organization. Everything's on Zoom now, um, everything. Uh, uh, are we gonna have events? Are people gonna be interested in events? Um, it's, it's kind of a fascinating time. Um, so I'm, I'm, so I'm looking you back. Asked me how to forecast. I said I, I I really don't know. No, listen. I I know we're all learning through this, but I, I as a PhD uh, uh, major that that you as a PhD expert, I wanted to uh, as a, as an economist, I wanted to ask you that question because I think you may uh you have you you have some good insight. Uh, especially because when you said 1987, I was just a I was just a young little boy, right? <laughs> So at that time, from 87 to 94, uh, I was in no way, obviously I was uh, already in, in the workforce. So I, I got to experience that. So what what lessons did you learn from 87 to 94? And then that, that other period from to, in, in 2008, are there any lessons that you learned yourself there that you could probably uh, apply, not today, nor, nor tomorrow, but probably Q4 or into 2021? Well, the lessons I learned, um, which feeds into the, the book Linking Mission to Money, and in, uh, when I was in government, we, we used the term structural balance, is, is what we learned is um, you absolutely must um, think in terms of several years. You can't just say, what am I going to do this year, or what's my budget for this year, because the reality of life is the business cycle. And uh, our, 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 our economy forgot about the business cycle. And the COVID is um, in many ways timely because when we hit 2019, we ended the first decade in 150 years without a recession. Well, COVID came three months later and now we have a recession. Did you, and, did you see that as a risk at that point? Sorry to interrupt you. Did you see a, that as a risk or? A... Yeah, we've been, we've been, um, we've been tooting our horns uh, since 2010 that um, anybody who's smart needs to start setting aside any business that's smart has to start building up its balance sheet, saving, if you will, because another recession is going to come. And we were really, talking to a lot of nonprofits is you've got to set up social enterprises to get some earned revenues right now because there's going to be a recession. And what always happens in recessions is philanthropy drops off, your government contracts get canceled, and you're going to be in trouble. And here we are. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, almost all the philanthropic emergency funds are going to those who did not prepare for a recession. Um, did you, do you remember the Aesop's story about the ant and the grasshopper? No, uh, go ahead and enlighten me. What? So it's an Aesop's fable. Um, and it, it's in the summer, there's an ant and a grasshopper. The, the ant is busily gathering food and storing it away. And the grasshopper is just eating away and partying and saying life is good. And then winter comes and the, the ant is in a cozy house with plenty of food and very comfortable. And the grasshopper is outside the ant's door, freezing to death and starving. Well, it's an Aesop's fable, so there are always had unhappy endings. So the ant says to the grasshopper, tough you know, and the grasshopper passes away. And so the lesson is you need to prepare for the winter. And um, what's happening right now is people are paying all their attention to the grasshopper and they're ignoring the ants and mm -hmm. the ants will run out of food by September. And then will the crisis be over and they'll start dying? We won't step up to help them. 
it's kind of a moral dilemma. Yeah. Um, do you help those that help themselves? Um, be nice if you could help both. Um, but um, right now that's not happening. So uh, from, my, from my understanding, we're talking about re reactive pro uh, versus uh, proactiveness, right? And uh, in, in a way. In so, a way. So I see, I see one of the books that you have, uh, Mission to Money, Finance to, uh, for Nonprofit Leaders. You talk about setting priorities. Is this, yes. what you're, is this what you're alluding to there about setting those uh, priorities? No. I mean, it, the book covers two things. It, one, it talks about business cycles and it talks about some of the dilemmas that um, the time when, you, when, a, when a nonprofit really has to say no to, um, to expanding services is when times are good. Because if you overexpand, um, you're going to have to cut back more. For example, in 2001, um, just before 2001, um, we had a lot of homeless shelters that expanded tremendously. Just make up some numbers. Let's say they went from 100 beds to 150 beds. Okay. Well, when the recession hit, they couldn't support 150 beds. They cut back to 75. Wow. Okay. Would have been better if they'd stayed at a hundred. Of course. Taken that extra cash, and used it to avoid a cutback. Well, there's a lot of problems in our society because if if that's if that shelter had set aside the money, would donors had said, "Well, you don't need our help anymore. You've you've got extra money." Um, would the shelter have been? Um, prescient enough, uh, looking ahead enough to basically say, well, actually, we think there's probably going to be a recession coming. We know that's when we're most needed. We need to really uh, set it up. Interestingly enough, uh, this has become routine in the government sector. They're called rainy day funds, but there's still a tremendous amount of resistance um, to, uh, to this in the philanthropic community. So walk me through that because uh, I see that one of the things that your social ventures does is that you you work in with community resources right uh to make an impact in the community whether it's art education employment job training health hunger to name a few uh how how does that process work if we if we stay with a hundred bed going up to 150 and then it reduces back to 75 throughout that throughout that same transaction do you go in and, and try to assist to mitigate reducing to 75 or do you step in after they've gone into 75? How, how does that process work? Well, um, what we do at Social Ventures is try to have that not happen in the first place. And the, the decrease, correct? To really try to educate people. I think we've made a, a lot of progress in the, the philanthropic community. Um, uh, in the last uh, seven years, more and more of our large corporate foundations are making um, uh, unrestricted operating support donations, um, which means, y yes, you can spend money on utilities. Yes, you can build your balance sheet. They used to just do program loans, program grants, where um, you essentially lost money um, from performing a grant. So we've made progress in that front. Um, the, um, the getting an organization to be uh, multi-year planning oriented is is um, requires a very strong leader who has vision and um, is able to think beyond um, the current year you know what what do I need to raise this money what kind of programs am I going to do and they, they start thinking about how does this year fit into the next several years and that's called financial planning and that's kind of been the the connecting link um, in my entire career, whether it's in government, in universities, or in um, the nonprofit sector, or in social enterprise. So from a leadership perspective, uh, this is something that I, I have a conversation with with all my guests on failure. Um, have you failed at, in, in, in the past at, uh, from a leadership perspective on anything? And if you have, what, what was it that you failed at? And what were the le lessons learned that pretty much made you who you are right now as a leader? Well, I think one of the one of the biggest um, challenges for a visionary leader is to not get too far ahead of their uh, constituency, whether it be a board or whatever. Um, 
you uh, you have to bring people along. Uh, you have to learn to be patient, which is sometimes hard when you know what needs <laughs> to be done. Um, it's hard to wait for other people to kind of catch up. Um, I was on a I was on a, uh, um, a Zoom call last night on a board I just joined, and um, uh, that board has at this point their all of their experiences are very short term orientation. The the notion of two thousand twenty two is something they aren't even thinking about. Um, the notion of um, of all the things you do which which two are more important than the others is a conversation they've never had. Um, one of the, um, one of the um, eye openers for me was um, I headed the uh, New York Financial Control Board uh, during the David Dinkins administration in New York City. Uh, the Financial Control Board is the receiver, so we have um, oversight and approval over the New York State, New York City budget. And um, David Dinkins, um, uh, 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 it's the first time he'd ever been a mayor. He'd always been in a um, legislative situation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he basically inherited the ongoing recession from the 87 stock market crash. And um, one of the things that we were able to help him understand is even in a recession, when you're having to scale back on your budget, you, you still can focus on cutting back the lower priority things. Because uh, what usually happens is you cut back on the things you know about, which generally tend to be the more important things. That you don't have to abandon your agenda. You don't have to abandon your priorities in tough times. Um, that's actually the most important time to use priorities. And that, that, that was not a common way of thinking about budget cutting. Um, budget cutting, you know, you, you tend to uh, go for the big numbers. And uh, uh, sometimes your low priority things aren't so visible and you forget about them. So um, that's what linking mission to money is all about is think about what your priorities are. Um, if you're losing money on low priority things, all that's doing is taking money away from your high priority things. But thinking about what are your priorities um, is very hard because generally it's, well, that's what we do. That's what we've always done. Um, we've done that for 10 years. And what I, what I tell um, any organization, whether they're a, uh, nonprofit or a social enterprise or a conventional business, if you're doing the same thing you were doing 10 years ago, you're probably not connected to your market anymore. That's true. Because the world's changing. That's true. So if you haven't changed, something's probably out of whack now, and it's time to really take a good look at it again. And um, I think that's universally true. And um, the times when things haven't worked out is is not being effective in getting people to truly internalize that message. So how do you, uh, so for any nonprofit out there or any small business for say that, that is listening to this, what are the, uh, what are the strategies to actually cope, to cope with that, with that internal awareness to actually say, Hey, I'm going to take care of that. How, how can I take care of the low hanging fruit? Or what are my low-hanging fruits? First of all, I think you have to create a budget <laughs> of some sort, though. What I guess, what are the characteristics or the process that you well, that you there's, think? There's, there's two parts. One's technical and the other's non-technical. Okay. The technical part is you, you have to know um, what all your activities are. I was working with one uh, organization. Um, they said, well, we just deal with people who have trouble hearing. And we started pushing them to, well, what do you do? What do you do? And when we were done, they had 22 different programs. So they thought they only had one. Yes. <laughs> and then, and then we, we, at the technical level, we said, okay, now you have to figure out 
how much you spend on each of those 22 programs. Of course. Because everyone's oriented to just looking at that single bottom line. Are we making money or losing money? Are we breaking even or not? And I said, you have 22 things. You have to tell me, are you making money, breaking even, or losing money? And that's a technical exercise that few do. Um, and um, it's, it, it's doable. It doesn't have to be impossible. And it definitely doesn't mean you have to do the super sophisticated thing called cost accounting. Then the, the, the non-technical thing is you have to really start getting to people to tease out. Okay, if you could only do two of those 22, which ones would you do? So instead of forcing people to do one through 22, you kind of get them to divide them into maybe three groups. Those things that you think are absolutely most essential, those you think that are pretty essential, and those that are nice to do, but you could hand it off to another organization. And so you just kind of parse it that way to give people permission, because nobody wants to say your program isn't important, because that staff member will feel bad. Of course. <laughs> and but it is important. It's just for this organization, it could be done by somebody else, maybe more efficiently. And in general, in the nonprofit world, because of the way the world works and the way the law works, um, a nonprofit really doesn't drop a program. It passes it on to another nonprofit. So um, it, you don't have to tell someone their thing isn't important. You tell them it's, it's not as central to what our organization can do well. Um, so you, there's a lot of human emotion. Um, and I think that's why a lot of organizations don't do that. And I think, uh, yeah, for sure. And that's, that's exactly what I was gonna say that, uh, the technical versus non-technical and prioritizing with high, medium, and low, like you said, not just for, for nonprofits. It could def definitely work for for profits as well. Or, you know, or, or 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 a household. It doesn't have to be a business. It's also a household as well. You know, when you're going through spring cleaning, as an example, just throwing that out there. Um yeah, it's actually easier for conventional businesses because um they uh they tend to do a lot of mergers. I mean, if you think about it, you name you can you name me twelve companies today that existed when you were born? Probably was... not. They've merged <laughs> out. They've merged into others. They've changed their products, and the merger process kind of becomes that cleansing. Not, not always elegant. Not always nice. Not always humane, but it just happens. Yeah. You buy the company. You know. You get bought out and. That's why most people, when they see a company's being bought, they think, oh, gosh, I'm going to lose my job because that's how companies purge. They bring in a different set of decision makers who um, don't have those human relationships. I'm not saying that's good. I'm saying it's why it happens more readily in the for-profit sector, conventional for-profit sector. For sure. Non-profit sector, you tend to have board members that have been on it for 15 years you tend to have people that have spent their whole life in the nonprofit, and it's it's a little harder to do and um but it's just as important now from the marketplace uh in social ventures that i that i see here there's a lot of categories on there how does that how does that work in and also at some point you have your social ventures has to make money right uh whether it's donations or through some other, some other means, is that where the the magic happens per se for the for the funding through that marketplace? Um. So uh, uh, on the philanthropic side, your question is is why do they support us? Um, most of our support comes from uh, the large uh, companies in town, not from the foundations. Um, and the large companies um, uh, support us because they understand the importance of sustainability of so a business. About, so we're talking about Jenny's, and, we're talking about American Electric Power as an example? American Electric Power, Nationwide, L Brands, yep. uh, Huntington Bank. Um, 
they um, they want the nonprofits. They want two things. They want the nonprofits to for their impact to be sustainable, okay. and they want the nonprofits to be less dependent upon philanthropy. Because the the reality nationally is corporate philanthropy has been on a downward trend for fifteen years. One of the um, pressures of the stock market, particularly um, in the last 10 years, is um, there's more and more um, powerful stockholders, shareholders, that are questioning corporate philanthropy. Because every dollar a company gives away is a dollar it's not giving to its shareholders. And they're under tremendous pressure. Yeah. Uh, I think in our community, our corporations have been remarkable in how they have been able to sustain their philanthropic activity uh, despite this pressure. But it's a reality. And so they they really support our efforts to help um, uh, nonprofits become less dependent upon that source because the other part about Columbus, which is unusual, um, and this this I learned when, um, when I was still a consultant, I helped form an organization called the Columbus Cultural Leadership Consortium, which has all of the 20 largest arts organizations. And uh, we did a lot of research. And what makes Columbus unusual is we are predominated by corporate philanthropy rather than individual philanthropy. Um, in most other cities, individual donations are the largest component of, of donations that a nonprofit gets. In this town, individuals aren't quite there. Um, uh, a company CEO is more likely to write a company check than a personal check. Um, and uh, so the, the notion of, of, of taking pressure off corporate philanthropy is especially important uh, for Columbus nonprofits. And many of them have been very, um, very proactive that way. Um, uh, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium uh, has Zumbizi Bay, a huge, very profitable social enterprise. Um, uh, 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 Life Care Alliance, which has um, the Meals on Wheels program has a very profitable LA catering business. Um, uh, the uh, Franklin Park Conservatory um, has a huge and very, very profitable event space called the Wells Bar. Um, the Columbus Museum of Art in its new um, uh, remodeling that are completed now has a professionally run gift shop and a professionally run cafe and the um, uh, best event space in town. So um, a lot of nonprofits have really stepped up. Probably the, the most remarkable one is Equitas Health, which um, runs uh, free and reduced cost clinics. Um, originally just in the AIDS space, but now in the, I'd say in the low income space. They have a for-profit pharmacy that has become so profitable that they were able to open a brand new clinic in the King Lincoln district yep. without philanthropy. <laughs> um, so there are some really outstanding examples of nonprofits who have really uh, grabbed the, grabbed the horns and um, started to chart out a um, independence. Uh, COSI um, eight years ago bought a national for-profit consulting company on experiential learning that which one is that which uh, one is that, that one that, um i'm not quite sure its name right now it's changed since their leadership changed but okay. when i worked with them it threw off a quarter million dollars that they wow. didn't have to fundraise for so there's a lot of really outstanding examples of uh of um, nonprofits who are um stepping up uh to use social enterprise to be more sustainable. So yeah, you gotta be innovative in a way to actually uh, do that, right? So- um, be Innovative and brave and creative because it's, it goes against the grain of a nonprofit. That is, that is true. I was uh, surprised to hear that from COSA. I had no idea that they actually did that, but you know, they are a huge uh, part of Columbus. So, you know, they- Well, what it also allowed, 
what it allows them to do is they have the largest free and reduced family membership program in the state of Ohio. Which one is that one? Um, families who are, um, uh, I, I don't know the exact criteria, but let's say eligible for food stamps. I don't know. Um, can get a family membership for $18 a year. I didn't know that. So hopefully Cosi is not. I think, I, I think nonprofits need to start tooting their horn. They're very, many of them are nervous about saying, I make money on this so I can do that. It's not, it's not a common story. Yeah. And many of them are uncomfortable. You won't hear the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium talking about, ever talking about how much money it makes about Zoom BZ Bay. So they're nervous. So are there any other uh, uh, key takeaways that you would suggest for uh, other nonprofits out there that are not associated with you or just are listening that are outside of the Columbus area? Obviously, you spoke about the technical and non-technical side. Are there any other uh, piece, pieces of like uh, tips that you would have for them to actually in these sure. troubling times? Well, these troubling times are different because you've just been told to shut down whether your market exists or not. Correct. Um, so. Um, so I don't really have any advice during this time except hold on, um, you know, and um, stay in touch with your market, stay in touch with your customers, stay in touch with your donors. Although you can't do anything right now, keep the communication lines. When it's over, my main message to nonprofits is think about what you do well and who you do it for and is it possible for you to do it in addition at a different place for a different person or at a different price mm. um for example hospitals have done this all the time um the mount carmel hospital system owns the new albany surgical center the New Albany Surgical Center has a profit margin of over 33% when last reported. That's huge. That's amazing for any That's business. Huge. Of course. What, is, what does it do? It funds their charity care programs elsewhere. It funds all the losses on their Medicaid programs in their Franklinton and Grove City operations. Um, so what they've said is, if I can do... Um, uh, orthopedic surgery for people with insurance who can pay $35,000 when it only costs me $10,000. I'm able to provide charity care for an awful lot more people than I could otherwise. Um, we've seen examples of, uh, of uh, uh, social enterprises, nonprofits, who they did weatherization in the low in low income neighborhoods for free. Um, but they had to have uh, good installers, they had to have good inspectors, they had to be able to uh, meet uh, uh, certain standards. Well, if you can do that in a low-income neighborhood, you can go to the wealthy suburbs and set up a business to do that too, and then use the money you make. They changed the place, the person, and the price, so they could continue to do weatherization in the low-income neighborhoods. That's, that's the classic formula that works for most nonprofits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now the uh, the three the three different companies that you said have st stepped back be uh, because of this COVID. Um, what are the why did they step back? Number one, uh, I could say I could I could assume, but they I don't want to. They went okay. out of business. Okay. Um, what about the? Uh, do you foresee others stepping back as well because of that same reason? Um, I I do. I don't know specifically. We are in the process of reaching out to every single one of the social enterprises. Um, many of them have fallen silent. So we're trying to reach them by phone to say, are you still there? Uh, are you still in business? Um, are you just on hold? Um, uh, just a handful have made announcements. Um, Empower Bus announced last week they're going out of business. Uh, Prism Magazine announced last week they're going out of business. Um, uh, Elvis House announced last week that they are uh, suspending their, they're closing down their lawn care social enterprise. Um, I'm sure there'll be more. Um, 
it, it all depends on how 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 strong the company was before it was forced to stop selling. So you mentioned before you mentioned before as, as a leader, you're a visionary, um, and now we're talking about innovation. How are you, are you? I'm assuming you have a plan in place or thinking about how can social ventures uh, start innovating, right, in the future, whether it's Q3, well, Q4. We, we've, already, we, we've already made some pivots. For example, one of our, our main areas of earned revenue was um, putting on um, social enterprise markets at the business locations where we basically, over lunchtime, we bring in you know, let's say 15 social enterprises, their staff come through, they buy from the social enterprises, that's the connection to consumer. Well, that's not happening now, right? And um, so what we've pivoted is, well, what ways can we help connect um, individuals to social enterprise products in the meantime? So we, in seven days, conceived and launched an impact box program where people can go online, to our website and they can buy products. We've got um, four social enterprise products so far. Next week, we're expanding to six uh, social enterprises. Um, we lost that. It's, um, we're averaging about $200 of sales a day now. I hope it builds. Um, they can go to our, our website, um, uh, www.socialventurescbus.com slash impact boxes. And, um, and see what's there. Um, we've been constantly innovating. Um, we sold uh, candles, coffee, hot sauce, and dog bones. And we've, we've now got ground coffee or bean coffee. We've got two flavors of coffee. We've got three fragrances for candles. We've got three different kinds of hot sauce. Next week, we're, we're adding in um, uh, uh, organic fruit treats that are made by a social enterprise in Akron that employs disabled individuals. Um, so we've, we've pivoted to say, okay, our job is to connect individuals to consumers. We can't do it through job site uh, you know, markets. Now we'll try, we'll set it up online and, and see what we can do there. And, and that's the kind of innovation that I think one has to do is, okay, what was your main goal? Our main goal is to connect customers to social enterprises. We couldn't do it the way we've been doing it. Hopefully that'll come back soon. What can we do now? Um, so we've actually started a new business from scratch and uh, we'll see how it evolves. We're learning every day what the market wants. Listen, it's, it's so all about- That's an okay. example of innovation. Uh, and that. So um, for our, our social enterprises, um, I think the hardest thing right now for any business is how do you maintain your vision when you're worrying about cash? And I suspect most of our small businesses have gotten nothing from the government at all. And um, they're just saying, how long can I keep people on staff? Um, how many do I have to lay off to conserve cash? Um, you know, um, we haven't laid anybody off because I'm just acutely aware of the financial reality of my employees. Um, they would be in crisis if if we cut back, and um, um, I'm I'm just hoping that we can resume events and people will be interested in doing on-site programming um have to play it by ear we run out of cash in september so you know that creativity is really really important uh because i think the uh, the fact that you ended up pivoting from that visionary standpoint is pretty pretty uh pretty strong and uh from your perspective but a couple of things that i want to ask you there is the uh your character, I think, is pretty strong, in my opinion. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because as a leader, you could easily say, I'm going to shave off, uh, you know, back to what we we're talking about, uh, the, the low-hanging fruit. And you could say, I'm going to reduce my workforce and let them go. But you're aware of who your employees are. And if you end up, uh, so that vicious cycle, right? They, they were, they were, from an econ economy standpoint. So you're obviously you you have the uh, the education that uh, that you know what what it looks like, 
but now you're on the other side of the fence and you see the reality. So from a uh, from your perspective, not your, your perspective, but your character from a human ca- character, I, I applaud you for doing that because you're keeping them Thank as you. much as possible. No, seriously, it's uh, listen, uh, you and I and everybody else in the world, we we, uh, we try to avoid as much as possible the, the media or the news because it could be very uh, detrimental as, at times. But some things that we have seen is that 22 million people have filed for unemployment in, in the United States of America. And that's literally 4.4%. There's a, a lot of economists that say that that, uh, that 4.4 is gonna be in the double digits uh, when we actually get the real number in April or, or, or May. So from a character perspective, what do you think has shaped you in your life from a leadership perspective and your character to basically take a step back and say, you know what, I'm not going to reduce, reduce my labor force because that what you just said right there, I know who they are and the impact that's going to have on their lives. Well, um, without seeming corny, I don't want people start with their parents. Um, my, uh, my, my father was a, a teacher and my mother was a hospital administrator in a small town. Um, she knew the name of everyone in her hospital, including the custodians. And uh, she, she grew up on a subsistence farm and she, she felt that everyone was just as important as the doctors in a culture that is very hierarchical. That's true. Um, and my father the really felt that his job was to be a porter and advocate of his students, even when that meant taking on the administration. And uh, you just see that. Um, the um, I started out. Um, uh, I think that that orientation of helping people uh, has always been there. And in in my early career, I I had the um, um, privilege of of working at some pretty high levels. And um, the way that manifested itself was uh, most economists are trained to say, this is the question I'm interested in. This is the question I'm going to answer. And this is, I'm going to give you my opinion. And what, what I saw was what really mattered was the person that we worked for, what was their question and did we give them an answer they could use? And um, so that um, even when I was the deputy budget director for New York City, um, uh, during the, the fiscal crisis, uh, Ed Koch was the mayor at the time. Um, my job wasn't to tell him what I thought was going to happen to the revenues and economics in the next 12 months. My job was to tell him the various scenarios of how it could play out and when he would know which scenario materialized and to let him decide which he could work with because my job wasn't to undermine him. My job was to give him information he could use in his leadership decision-making. And that, that is what we now call servant leadership. Yep. Um, though I find the term actually not very helpful, but that's kind of <laughs> what it is is uh, my job is is to figure out what you need and to help you do it. Obviously, there are some times when um, you're asked to do something that you uh, do not believe is consistent with your values, and that has led me to leave some jobs um, because I, I just wouldn't do it. Listen, uh, you started that, that, that answer by saying you don't want to be corny. Uh, I don't think that, that definitely what, uh, you were not corny at all. Uh, I think the, uh, the way you started that, that answer with your, you know, your, where you grew up with your parents and how your parents, you saw how your parents uh, were interacting with any, any individual, the custodian uh, effect. And I think, you know, I agree with you. Um, 
I agree with you completely because uh, that's how that's how I approach things too. That uh, you could be the CEO, I'm going to give you the respect you you, you deserve, obviously. Or, uh, but at the same time, I think custodians are their own CEOs as well because let's face it, they have the keys to the kingdom, and uh, with the keys to the kingdom, they know every everybody in the operation. They know what's going on, and they may have a little bit more insight of what's going on with the boots on the ground more so than the individuals that are uh, the shareholders or or whatnot so i applaud you for saying that well i thank you um you know it, it's there's a there's a concept of management called managing by walking around yes and, and, and i i think that uh the ground the, the the basis for that is you got to have a lot of humility that even if you're in the c-suite you don't know everything that's true. And um, your job is to have perspective. And um, how do you get perspective? When my board members say, well, what do you look for from a board member? And I said, well, to me, what a board member brings is perspective because you are episodically involved in what we do. I'm in there every moment. You can see things differently. So I need to know different perspectives. And frankly, especially in a very large organization, you need to have ways to get to know what's going on and and to have perspectives outside of that bubble, which is called the C-suite. That's true. Um, So two more questions uh, uh, because I know you're a busy man and I don't want to, I could have a uh, continue talking, but (laughs) uh, what's one thing that people don't know about you that you wish that they knew or that you, you wanted them to know? I started out as a musician, and I really? was at the New England Conservatory. And uh, I studied under a remarkable man named Vic Firth, who those who are in percussion or drums know that name. And um, that's always been my heart, but I couldn't make a living in 1972 in music in a way I wanted to. Um, no, no offense to people getting married, but almost every wedding is the same as the other one. And in 1972, it was waltzing Matilda, and I would rather shoot myself than make a living. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so drums, is that what you played before? Or drums, now? actually a uh, concert percussion. I, um, I, uh, Sold my drums uh, four years ago, but I still have a concert grand marimba and a uh, vibraphone, which I can't awesome. bear to part with. But uh, <laughs> I've had to move away from my music uh, a long time ago to make a living. Listen, uh, I used to play the uh, I used to play the the baritone and the tuba. Uh, and oh, really? I, yes, sir. I used to play the tuba, part of the marching band in my high school, and I think that's you know I. Again, I was in high school. I, I didn't know, you know, too much. But I said, "Hey, I don't think I could make a living off of playing the tuba the rest of my life." But now that I'm, <laughs> but a lot of people do. A lot of people, you know, they're in. Uh, uh, so a lot of respects for musicians out there that are, are definitely figured out how to do it. But I, me, when I was 17 years old, I I didn't know. I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. Sometimes I actually do miss playing the tuba in the atmosphere of actually just be, being with a crowd of people um, and playing uh, some beautiful music. So, uh, you know, I applaud well, you. Well, for- I, I, one, one of my dreams is to learn to play the piano because the best way to continue to play music is to be able to play by yourself. And the problem with drums or tuba is you have to be in a group with other people. And I haven't played in a rock band since 1980. So I think I, I think I see uh, as a visionary. I'm also a visionary too. I think uh, in the next six months, I think you and I should learn an instrument and just play. <laughs> you can play uh, the drums or whatever it is, the piano, and I'll try to. You know, saxophone is one of the one of the uh, uh, instruments that I. It's a very. Um, it's very, it, it's, it plays beautiful music. There's another word that, I, that, I, that I'm not going to say here, but it's, it's it's a beautiful. So music. would you would you look for uh, uh, a soprano sax, an alto sax, or a tenor sax, which really intrigues you? I think tenor. Ah, oh, you want the big one. 
Tenor. I think tenor. I think tenor. I mean, I think all three of them are, are pretty interesting, but I think the tenor is just the 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 sound that it makes. I don't know. It can go high, but it can really honk. Oh yeah. Honk. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's... Final question for you. Uh how can people help social ventures make uh, today? I know you mentioned the uh, how you pivoted with the with the impact box. Uh, and I think there's more- really there's there's two ways um, they can help us today during the COVID virus. Is yep. um, we we have seen our major revenue sources cut off like everyone else. Um, the foundations are not are, are funding the grasshoppers. We're an ant. Um, they can uh, buy the impact boxes and they can donate to us. We would really benefit with donations even you know 10 bucks helps um you know so i can keep my staff on payroll um it's socialventurescbus.com slash impact boxes when you go to that site it'll give you the option to donate or to buy one of our impact boxes and if you buy an impact box you're helping to provide cash to organizations that are transferring all their profits to the food bank system employing survivors of trafficking, giving jobs to people who are developmentally disabled, and um, uh, uh, helping people that are survivors of trafficking. It's, it's a way you can really do some good. We all drink coffee, or we burn a candle, or we give our dog treats, you know, um, and, uh, uh, or we like to spice up those noodles because they're getting so boring. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's, something, that's something you can, you can do. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a lot of money, but it'll make a lot of difference. And to stay in touch with our general social enterprises, when this COVID crisis is over, go to our website, click on the marketplace. You can sort by product, sort by cause. You can look at a map, see where they're located and make the notion of buying social a part of your every day. This may be, you know, date me, but there was a commercial for V8 juice was, I could have had a V8. Yeah. I want people to say, I could have bought social. I didn't, go, I, instead of going to Starbucks, I could have gone to Roosevelt Coffee, you know. Um, instead of coffee. going to uh, Candle Works, I could have gone to 11th Candle. Um, there's a, those are choices. And in the front of your mind, when you get your grass cut, you can have your grass cut by a social enterprise. You can have your house painted by a social enterprise. You can have your deck fixed and repaired by a social enterprise. Um, it's amazing what you can do. And when, when we're back in our offices and you order in lunch for a meeting, you can have a social enterprise box lunch for that meeting. There's just unbelievable ways that what you do every day, you can start to make an impact without spending a, more money than you're already spending. So here's my pledge to you. I think I'm, I'm gonna take you up on that offer for the uh, for the grass maintenance of my of my house on a personal level. But uh, for anybody out there that's listening, uh, I would like for you to please uh, share with me at least a picture or two of the impact box. That way I can share it also on the social media page because uh, uh, I'm highly active on social media. So uh, one of the things that I'm gonna do for you is uh, put that impact box uh, picture that you that you provide and put a, put in all the links on there. Uh, that way to to help y'all. I know you said ten dollars is a, is a little bit, but trust me, like I mentioned before, and I'll say it again. Uh, as a founder of a nonprofit organization before, and also as a founder of a small business myself, that I also lost my, my small business, every single penny counts. So I'm gonna do my best to help you out. Um, and Great. every single, thank you. yeah, for sure. So Alan, Dr. Proctor, thank you so much for being part of the conversation uh, with the with me, Luis uh, Ramirez, I'm the host. And again, you could also uh, reach out and subscribe either on YouTube, Instagram, uh, or uh, SoundCloud, or also podcasts to listen to this audio and video, which will be posted soon. Dr. Allen, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Have a good right. week. Stay Me healthy. Too. For sure. Thank you. <laughs>